Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. There used to be a time when my partner had to adjust in the first few moments of a channeling. There was a, a time where he had to actually change his countenance, try to relax, let the pineal flow without what is called the filters of human consciousness, belief. And now I just jump in whenever I want. <laughs> it's the way of it. That the practice of communicating with spirit pays off. And you get better at it. And so the human being is asked to practice. Now don't take this wrong. For in a linear fashion, that would mean, well, I'm going to have to assign times for meditation and extend them. And that's not so. What if I told you it may just be the opposite? That your meditations would be shorter but more intense. Meditation is beautiful. It is a time put aside for communication with that which is inside and outside. And yet it indeed is also changing. What if it were possible that every time you'd blink your eyes, you'd be in meditation? <laughs> that it would be so intrinsic to the value of your cellular structure to be in this mode that your cells would just crave it. They would crave to be in meditation 24-7, but a walking meditation, a working meditation. So that as you get up out of your chair, there's no difference, really, than when you sit down to meditate. That that kind of a relationship with your higher self would be doable for the human being. And this is what the masters have taught. It is doable. And not only is it doable, it is something that your cells want for you. You've got this missing bridge that my partner has talked about between corporeal self and innate self. The intelligent part of your body literally craves to be in touch with the rest. To have human consciousness not only aware of it, but always working with it. There's part of your cellular structure that feels this is coming, dear ones. More than ever before, as energy shifts, the quantum parts of you are alert. They really have a feeling, if you want to say, that it is at hand. This also creates in a human being sometimes a little discomfort because you don't know what's next. Every single time you feel change coming, the human being wonders whether it's going to be good or not. And so I'm here to tell you, oh soul, what you are feeling now, I want you to relax with. I want you to relax with it and let it in. And the expansion will be the result. The expansion of you with you, of you with your higher self, isn't it time? Isn't it time to meet the rest of you? Think about that. You're bigger than you think, and I'm going to continue this teaching from last night about the soul. I only have a couple more things to say about it. And you may have heard it before. My partner may have mentioned it before in his talks. But I want you to hear it from me. And so this would become part two of what we call soul journeying. Now, the soul isn't journeying anywhere. It's you who are journeying to meet it. <laughs> 
You're cognizing what it is. You are journeying to meet yourself. And we have named it this way for a reason. It's not linear. You have to look at it backwards in order to understand the profundity of it. Before I begin, I would like to say, and I know where I am, it's precious here. I've told you it is a piece of Lemuria here. I've told you the Pleiadians are here. The very creative source, the beauty of a benevolent society that would be in ascension status and be your spiritual parents, that energy is here. There are only a few places on the earth, there's only really 24 of them, who have been assigned the attributes of time capsules. They pair up eventually, and you'll understand the push-pull energy between them. One pushes what you don't have, and one removes the old stuff you don't need. <laughs> That's how they work. By the way, that's also the attributes of the push-pull energy in the center of the galaxy you have mistakenly called a black hole. It's not a singularity. It cannot exist. We have said this before. Isn't it interesting that in physics everything comes in pairs and then when you look at the middle of the galaxy there's only one thing? Where is your common sense? There's got to be a pair there also. There always is in physics. There's a push-pull energy what we call the twins are there and there's a reason for it in physics and they will discover it it's just unseen at the moment there's a node in New Zealand it's an important one it's because this is a piece of Lemuria and because it is a previous home or an existing one depending upon how you look at time to those which helped you create the divinity inside you We've spoken of it before and it is Mount Cook and so I'm just going to take a moment to say thank you for the ones who took the time to respect it and to look at it and it says thank you back. There's a lot to know about that and as time unfolds and it gets paired up with its counterpart I want you to look at the energies between them and realize why they are what they are. Enough said for that. I want to continue my journey of the human soul. It's not human. <laughs> we call this the human soul because we're on earth, because we are with you, and because that's what you call it. But it isn't. The soul is the creator. We've told you this before, long before. This earth was even cool. The soul existed and it would eventually be part of you. It's eternal in both directions. And so I want to take you on this journey. Where have you been? <laughs> Before the Pleiadians did what they did on this planet, where were you? Did you have anything to do with what came before this planet? Or, as some of those who would be the experts in spiritual things would tell you, that everything started when you arrived? Really? I want to give you some information. It makes it so much bigger for you. There have been many worlds before yours that have gone through what you've gone through. We've given you some of the names of those in the past that you would even recognize. The Pleiadians are the most immediately removed from you. They are your spiritual parents. They did the work. And they watch over you like parents would watch a child that has totally, completely free choice without even knowledge of their parents. There is benevolence, there is love, there is caring, especially now. There is an awakening on this planet, you have passed this 
precession of the equinoxes. You're in an energy that I foresaw and I told you about 23 years ago. And here we sit. There's celebration in certain parts of the galaxy because of this planet Earth. Oh, don't look at your news today, okay? This is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about current events. I'm talking about world events. Not world as you would think of it in the news. But world that is the earth from its creation to now. And all the things that have taken place in the way they have. What you've done with it. You're sitting on the precipice of massive change. You have free will. You always have. You always will. But we've seen this before. And here's what I want to tell you. So have you. <laughs> For some of you, this is the 12th or 13th time you've done this. Do you realize that? Your soul has been involved in other places, in other planets, in other constellations. Life is so old in this galaxy, dear ones, compared to yours. So old. Life could start as easily as a few million years when a planet is ripe and ready and begins properly and accelerates in the right way. Not that hard. You will find eventually, listen science, this is a prediction, you will find eventually that when you discover life in other places that are not related to this planet, it will have the same kind of DNA structures. These DNA structures are common to the galaxy. It is how life develops. Oh, there will be some variations, but you will see a commonality that will tell you that what you have on the planet is not unique. Hardly. When you look out at the stars, and ask yourself, is there life? It's like standing on a beautiful beach on the planet and asking if anywhere else on the planet there's another beach. <laughs> Just because you can't see it. The processes that would create a beach on your planet are the processes that would create your planet itself and other planets that would have life. You've been part of the process. Not the corporeal you, but the soul you, the part of the collective you. The part that you can touch right now if you want to. The most profound way through the pineal. And start a communication with your cellular structure. That at first, you won't even feel it. You won't even know it's there. But when you open a door and keep it open, very, very slowly the energy seeps in, in a very benevolent and sweet way, so it doesn't surprise you or shock you or make you afraid. And you wake up one day, and you realize you're not alone. You realize that there is help. You realize you're more peaceful. You realize you're more healthy. And then you start realizing it's working. That's how it works. Do you realize why that is? So we don't frighten. So do we don't startle. Humans are slow to cognize things they have never seen before or never imagined before. So there is no fear. And so we go slow. There's nothing more beautiful than awakening human being. Finding that which is missing in their life is really there all along. Somebody needed to hear that. You have been part of the plan. You have been a soul of the Pleiadians. The Pleiadians had a planet before theirs, older, much older than theirs, in another constellation in this galaxy, and you were part of that. They're your grandparents. And their name is Octorian. <laughs> They're also the Sumerian. There are, there are so many. 
There are so many ways that this happens. If you're working with these groups, dear ones, and you want to know who they are or where they came from, they're just going to smile at you. But they're here to help. The way grandparents help. Pleiadians are different. They've got responsibilities. <laughs> the others don't. They're just here to play with you. To help you. There's so much help. There is an allowance we have of these who have helped plant the seeds in this galaxy to come here to this planet which is the only planet of free choice and walk among you and be part of you. Their guides, their helps, their whatever you want to call, their advisors. And the only rules they have is you have to see them. They cannot announce themselves to you. Many have. There have been many who actually have sensed them and feared them. There's many who think that they're visitors that perhaps are going to capture their soul or kill them just because they don't even understand. There is a wall. You call it a veil between multidimensional things like that and who you are. And this wall, this veil, is beginning to lift. Now I want to tell you so you understand and know this that the veil lifts because you pull it up. Brute force of consciousness and spiritual awakening will pull the veil up. It doesn't go up by itself. It doesn't get thinner by itself. It just sits there waiting for you to pull on it. That is the arrangement. You have got to do it. Let me put it in better terms and stop the metaphors. If you're going to awaken to who's around you who is multidimensional, it's going to be on your terms, not ours. And that's always the way it has been. You've got to search if you're going to find it. God is not going to present a situation to you that's going to give you positive proof of who you are or what's on the other side of the veil. This is, if you want to call it, a puzzle for you to figure out. It has to be that way. And every single planet that has gone through this has figured it out in this fashion. And here's what I want to tell you. And here's how it applies to today's teaching. You were there. You were there. Does this carry over into your Akash? A little. But not as much as your experience on earth. Now we're going to get there in a moment. I want to tell you there's two things that I want to remind you of. And we've given them before, but we're talking about souls in general. So I want to tell you what they are. The first is this. Even though yesterday we told you you cannot put human attributes on God, and that it's a mistake to think that the creator of the universe has these human things, there's still one that you always seem to develop on your own. It's an old energy concept that's going to have to disappear before anything happens of significance to you. And that is the, the concept of judgment. Judgment is a human attribute, an old human attribute, an old energy human attribute, that is separatist. Judgment comes from one human looking at another or one civilization looking at another and deciding that the other civilization is not behaving properly. Judgment is one human being looking at another and saying they're not doing it right. Judgment is everywhere. All over the planet always has been. Judgment creates wars. And so naturally, when you build your religious structures, judgment is God. And it isn't. And it isn't. And it never was. But it's ingrained into you. Am I doing it right? How often do we hear that? 
Dear Spirit, I don't want to offend any, any angelic <laughs> entity anywhere here. Dear Spirit, I don't want to do the wrong thing. Dear Spirit, this or that. What are you afraid of? Judgment? You're still doing it. And that is why I'm talking like this. You're still doing it. You're walking around feeling small. Why is that? Why do you humble yourself before God? Now I just got in trouble, didn't I? That's expected, is it not? Be humble before God. If you are a piece of God, why are you humbling yourself before yourself? Does this make sense? Spiritual common sense. If you're a piece of creation, you don't have to bow to yourself. What if instead we said it's time to stand up from the humbling position and take the power that's yours in benevolence, in courtesy, in generosity, in integrity, not humbleness. <laughs> what good is it going to do to grovel before God? And how is that helping the planet, groveling before God? The reason I'm in trouble with this message is because that's what you've been given since day one. God is great, you're not, therefore you should bow a little. But if you apply the teachings of yesterday and today, and you start to realize that you are a piece of this majesty that is God itself, that it's in every single piece of trillions of DNA molecules in you, and that they all have a consciousness of wanting you to discover what that is, do you think they want to be worshipped? The answer is no. I want you to start thinking differently about God, about the soul that you have inside. You deserve to awaken to your magnificence. How about that statement? And the magnificence does not show itself in egotism. You don't stand and beat your chest and tell everybody how good you are. No master has ever done that. You awaken to the wisdom and the maturity of mastery. What is one of the chief attributes of mastery? Silence. You knew that. Be still and know you are God. It's silence. There's an internal knowing where you can breathe the air of the planet and you can remember and you can say, you know, the air of the other planet, it was pretty much like this one. <laughs> You're wise beyond words because you've been there and done that and perhaps you don't know the details. But just sit there for a moment and be quiet. Can't you feel who you are? Is this too far removed? Is this too far removed from your intellectual pursuit? Is this too far removed from your 3D logic to think that there was more to life than what you've been told? There is no judgment. Stop humanizing God and creating attributes of situations that are human applied to God. How many times have we heard there are trapped souls someplace? They may be trapped between one place and another, and then humans will decide what those places are. They'll create levels, perhaps, the soul is trapped between three and five. It's all human made. You know this. How can the creator of the universe be trapped? There is no individual soul energies. It's all part of the whole. It is a collective that is part of you. And when you expire corporally and move on to the next level, the soul is collected from your body and becomes part of the whole again. Now when you, when you sense somebody who's departed, 
that is singular and it's hard to describe to you it's actual it's real we've even told you that pieces and parts of your loved ones who have passed over the ones especially just recently become part of you for your life that's soul sharing dear ones it's important you understand how this works so how can you have part of God trapped between some human created levels and the answer is it's impossible can I call it what it is it's mythology at its best so the next time somebody looks at whatever it is they're looking at and said that's a result of a soul being trapped inside yourself I want you to know better it's not necessary for you to speak up and say well now that's not exactly right <laughs> that's not what the masters do either no I want you to know better and the reasoning for this is so you don't see a system that doesn't exist I want you to see the system that exists and that one is beautiful there's no issues there's no problems there's no trappings there's no purgatories. There's no, there's no soul that goes someplace in preparation for something else. We told him that yesterday. There's no levels of soldom. God is God. The creator of this universe is what it is. It's not segmented. It's not trapped. And it does not have a consciousness like humans do. It's beyond that way beyond that it's something I can't even describe for you all you have to know is that it loves you beyond measure and everything that is there for you is benevolent you don't have to jump hurdles dear ones you have to prove yourself one way or the other you just have to agree to learn more about what is there inside you and the rest will be something that will be self-evident and we say it again when you go to your knees if you wish to do it if you want to honor God in any way you want to when you pray when you meditate we're there and there's only really one question if you want to ask a question that you should have and the question is dear God tell me what I need to know there's only one And the reasoning is this, is that all of the other things that you could possibly ask are subservient to that one. Tell me what it is I need to know, dear spirit, in order to solve the problem to get from A to B. There's somebody here who needs to hear that. Here's what I'm going to, you know who you are. I want you to go to a place and ask spirit this, tell me what it is I need to know to get out of pain, all right? You didn't come to suffer, dear ones. It's time to get through that. Someone needed to hear that. Shouldn't have to live that way. That was not the plan. Whatever has happened, water under the bridge that brings you to that place can be undone. You have control over your own cellular structure, and it wants to hear from you. I want to bring up the final one this one is difficult we always save the best to last <laughs> the ones that are hard to understand concepts that are perhaps things that you haven't really pondered much and I'll give it to you and this has to do with what we would call soul inheritance when you look at inheritance as you perceive it it's mostly in three dimensions and it is what we would call chemical and the confusing part is that you as a human being especially one who is aware of your spiritual complement are dealing with an oxymoron you are dealing with two kinds of inheritance that happen within one single body now the chemical inheritance is that which you're taught in school and it carries over with it a lot of what your parents had and your grandparents had. You look like them. 
Perhaps you will have dispositions in cellular structure. Your DNA carries through. There are things that you pass. There are talents. There are instincts that your parents would have. And you can see it. Some of you can even look at your hands and recognize your parents' hands are there. That's chemical inheritance. It's powerful. The man who sits in the chair in front of you right now has a chemical inheritance. His chemistry is Irish. And if he tracks back his lineage, he will find that it's not too many generations before he finds himself in Ireland. And he can track his name, which is very Irish, right back to a family who is there. And he's done it. Someday he may even visit. That is his chemical inheritance. Now you don't know the story, and now is not the time to give it, but we have exposed to him his immediate past life. And it was not Irish. It was across the ditch in Australia. And that is who he is. Now here is the issue. Who is he? <laughs> is he Irish or is he Australian? He has one path which is Akashic and one path which is chemical. And so he is a combination, a unique human being who has an entirely different past. When you look at the Akashic family compared to the Irish one, which is chemical, and they are both accurate. Is that confusing enough or what? It doesn't have to be. When you look at the parable of Emily, and Evelyn and all the other trees we didn't even name. Jason's one of them. I'm giving you names that mean things to those of you who are here. <laughs> who stand in the forest who are all together because they have the same roots. Remember yesterday? So what I want to show you and tell you is that you have to start looking at yourselves differently about who you are based upon both kinds of inheritance. The chemistry you have, you track back and you think, well, my past life was then perhaps my partner well, had to be Irish. No, it doesn't. You just have the attributes of chemistry. The real past life, the one you want to look at, is Akashic. And what is confusing about this is how there can be two paths that are so different that then create a unique human being like you. And you want to separate them, and you want to say which one is accurate, and I'll tell you, they both are. <clears throat> Take my partner. He assumes, and now he knows, that he is part of his parents and his grandparents and their parents, that he has the chemistry of all of them. But he also knows that the part of him that is God that he knows is involved in his Akashic remembrance, and those are the lives he lived with other chemistry from other parents and other grandparents. The result is this, dear ones, don't overanalyze it. I want you to look at yourself. That's all I want you to look at. How has this come together to create who you are? How has this come together to create who you are? You are a unique, unique human being, absolutely unique. This is part of the uniqueness. Chemically, you have attributes of 3D inheritance. Spiritually, you have attributes of Akashic inheritance. They come together to create you. Where it goes from here will create another you. The corporeal complications and the puzzle are beyond anything you can imagine. I have just entangled the puzzle that some will listen to. And they'll start to realize the puzzle has always been there. It's going to unravel some things that you didn't understand. How your lives, when read by a, an Akashic reader, can take you on a whole different path than what you know your parents did. And now you have the answer. Don't try to figure it out. I want you only to see the beauty of how it has created you. 
Is that good enough? That's all you have to look at. Unique in every single way. You've got the best of everything. Perhaps you've got the strength of the chemistry that you needed and the Akashic lives that you needed to build an old soul who can make a difference on this planet today. Did you think of that? Everything that you've gone through had a purpose. But you're done going to school. And you're done surviving. Now it's time to come out of the cave. See who you are. Check out the magnificence around you. Get out of the crouching position. Stand tall. Feel the light of God around you. And claim your mastery. Simple? No. <laughs> no. But you always start with small steps. And they turn into bigger ones. So now it's time to start. That's the message of the day. It'll get more complicated. I promise. <laughs> and so it is.